Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out. I have, a th I have a few thank yous as well, so please bear with me. First of all, I want to thank Ben Kaplan for shepherding this project through. Uh, thank you, Ben. I'd also like to thank everyone he thanked, but I won't repeat all their names because you really don't need to sit through it again. Um, I would like to add thanks to uh, people like Drew Friedman and Yid Life Crisis who, who, who helped us out as well. And I'd also like to thank the Borscht Belt Museum for co-sponsoring for co-sponsoring this launch event, and in fact, there will be borscht and blintzes available afterwards. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone who worked on the class and who participated in it, especially everyone at Evo who we hocked for about two years making this thing. Also, a special thank you to Dan Pasternak, who not only gave us great historical material, but also some great interviews. And some of those interviews with comedians and comedy writers that you'll find in the class include, among others, Robert Klein, Louis Black, Jenna Friedman, Paul Reiser, Mark Marin, and of course, Alan Zweibel and Judy Gold, uh, who are here with us uh, and who will be with us shortly for the more interesting part of this program. Uh, it is, I must say, great to see so many people here for the launch of this new class, Is Anything Okay? The Story of Jews and Comedy in America. I'm a little surprised at the number of people who came out for this, frankly, because we didn't really get a big, big crowd for the launch of our other class called The Internal Tur Turmoil of Isaac Bisheva Singer, <laughs> or IBS on IBS. <laughs> I knew a scatological Yiddish literary joke would hit with this crowd. To be honest, though, we don't normally hold launch parties for our classes, all of which are interesting and all are worth checking out regardless. And if any of you are wondering why the title of the class is, is anything okay? It comes from an old Borscht Belt joke in which a waiter walks over to a table of Jewish women, looks at, looks at them and says, is anything okay? And if you don't get it, the punchline is a reference to a distinctly Jewish dis dissatisfaction with everything, everything. right. <laughs> So why would a Yiddish-oriented historical research institute like YIVO do a class on the history of Jews and comedy? In part, because when you scratch the surface of American Jewish humor, you'll find Yiddish beneath it. But also because comedy is such an integral part of the American Jewish experience, and because Jewish comedians and comedy writers have played such a huge role and have contributed so much to the history of the field. Well known in history as the people of the book, the Jews may be better known today as the people of the joke. This new online course delves into the history of Jewish humor from the traditions of Purim spiel and Jewish wedding gestures in Eastern Europe to radically new forms of comedic output in the 20th century. From the earliest jokes told on the Lower East Side to the comedy routines honed in the Borscht Belt. We also delve into how Jewish comics in nightclubs and in film and in television, on television challenged many of the taboos of American culture. The story of Jews in comedy captures the journey of Jewish immigrants and their descendants and sheds lights on shifts in cultural identity and the role of Jews in developing new forms of comedy. The course features hundreds of archival objects, including rare vintage joke books, uh, sheet music, early comedy records, film and television clips, photographs, posters, and more, along with interviews with some of today's leading Jewish comedians, comedy writers, cultural critics, and academics. We hope that the course will, pr will provide some insight into the long history of Jewish humor, how it came to inform Jewish culture and American comedy, and why it is still relevant today. More than, a pre more than a presentation of comedic material, the class is an inquiry into the origins and development of Jewish humor and the ways in which different generations of Jews have dealt with a raft of cultural, political, and societal issues through the medium of comedy. The course itself can be found at yivo.org slash comedy. It's absolutely free to take, although if you wanted to make a donation, we wouldn't refuse it. It's now my pleasure to introduce our special guests for this evening. Don't get too excited. No, no, get excited, get excited. Judy Gold is a stand-up comedian, actress, television writer, and producer. She won two Daytime Emmy Awards. I'm sorry? Uh, <laughs> Save all that time for 
for me. Uh, right, okay, yeah, actually, yeah. Actually, yours is, yours is quick compared to his, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll be fast. <laughs> She won two Daytime Emmy Awards for her work as a writer and producer on The Rosie O'Donnell Show and has starred in comedy specials on HBO, Comedy Central, and Logo. She has written and starred in two critically acclaimed off-Broadway hit shows, The Judy Show, My Life is a Sitcom, and 25 Questions for a Jewish Mother. Uh, this is what they gave me. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not going to say. You could, I'll, I'll tell you after. Um, she's the author, author of Yes, I Can Say That. When they come for the comedians, we're all in trouble. She is currently the host of the hit podcast, Kill Me Now. Did you bring your Jew bell, Judy? I did not. Too bad. Alan Zweibel, on the other hand, has won five Emmy Awards for his work in television, which includes the first five seasons of Saturday Night Live, its Gary Shandling show, which he co-created and produced, The Late Show with David Letterman, and Curb Your Enthusiasm. His theatrical work includes his collaboration with Billy Crystal on the Tony-winning play 700 Sundays, Martin Short's Fame Becomes Me, and six off-Broadway plays, including Bunny Bunny, Gilda Radner, a sort of romantic comedy, which he adapted from his best-selling book. He has written 11 books, including his cultural memoir, memoir Laugh Lines, My Life Helping Funny People Be Funnier, the 2006 Thurber Prize-winning novel, The Other Shulman, the popular children's book, Our Tree Named Steve, and a parody of the Passover Haggadah. For this, we left Egypt, which he, which he wrote with Dave Barry and Adam Man Mansbach. Alan's humor has appeared in The New Yorker, Esquire, The Atlantic, uh, The New York Times, and Mad Magazine, among others. Alan received an honorary doctorate in 2009 from the State University of New York and has been honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Writers Guild of America. Please join me in welcoming Judy Gold and Alan Zweibel. Alan's, bi Alan's bio is longer than uh, Milton Berle's cigar. Milton Berle's cigar. That's funny. <laughs> well, look at this, uh, like Woodstock. There's a lot of people here. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. Um, I want to start with something I saw yesterday on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, there, I saw a tweet from the Jewish Women's Archive. So shout, oh, out, I love to, them. shout out to the Jewish Women's Archive. Uh, they were promoting, promoting a new comedy podcast, and uh, their tweet said, what's more Jewish than comedy? So this association with Jews and comedy is, is you know, part of what we're interested in here. And um, you know, I thought to myself, you know, what if you substituted a different ethnic group in, in that sentence? Could you say, what's more Chinese than comedy? <laughs> what's more Albanian than comedy? <laughs> So how does that work? What, what, what is this association? Why is it so deep? And what, what's happening here that you, that you can actually say a sentence like that? Judy, I think you can handle this beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Thank you. <laughs> well, if you think about who the funniest comedians are, they are outsiders. They are marginalized people. Uh, and... Jews, you know, people always ask me, why are there so many Jewish comedians? I always have said that, you know, when you get Bar, Bot, Benet, or B, or whatever the, oh, sorry. Um, I'm trying He's to so keep it close clean. To say. I know, I didn't say it. But I, when you I, get, I think it would be okay. when you become a Bar, Bot, or B, or whatever, mitzvah, what is your job? Your job is to take this text that has been around for thousands of years and make it your own, right? You're, you look, show people a different point of view. Um, and that's what a joke is, is looking at something from another perspective that no one's ever heard before. So I think we're, we're, we're critical thinkers, so that is you know, part of the reason why we're, we love comedy. But also, we, it's a coping mechanism, and it's a weapon. And we're skilled at using it both ways. And, um, you know, 
we have used it to get out of a lot of situations and to create a lot of great situations. And we're funny. <laughs> we're miserable. How could, yeah. We've been kicked out of every country in the world, okay? And how do we survive? We survive by deflecting. You know, you, you, you go right through when came over, you, even in Europe, you look at the uh, short stories of Shalom Aleichem, okay, and go back even to England, okay, and this is not a Jewish thing, but Jonathan, Jonathan Swift with Gulliver's Travel, a modest proposal, Monty Python, it's always about hitting up. When you're oppressed, the way you deal with it, you hit up. Okay, and so with Python, it was uh, the Queen, all right? It was, um, it was the Catholic Church, and with us, it was a mechanism. You, you look at Fiddler on the Roof, okay? It was the Tsarist Russia, okay? And they were making jokes as they were leaving Anatevka. Now, I'm sure that the real people weren't doing that, okay? But at the same time, I would bet you, if you read Shalom Aleichem's uh, Tevye the, the Milchia, the Tevye the Milkman, it's really funny. And that's the way we deal with it, you know? Um, there's a wonderful documentary that Fern Perlstein yeah. Did we should talk the, the last laugh about yeah. called the last laugh? You were in the Holocaust. You're in that too, right? Yes. We're all in yes. that, but we're all in it. Talking about those are two words you really don't hear a lot together in the same sentence: humor and Holocaust. But aside from all of us giving testimony, how far you can go with humor? Like Mel Brooks, I remember saying that um, when he did the producers, he did the Nazis, but he stopped short of the camps, right? But the main spine of the movie is the following this <clears throat> Auschwitz survivor named Renee something. There were two, one had a sense of humor. And, and one the other didn't. one was really yeah. dour. And right. um, the one who had a sense of humor, she told us that you needed a sense of humor to survive the camps. And there was footage of Jews putting on shows for the SS. And she, she said at the very, very end, of this uh, documentary to her friend who also went through it and was real dour. She said, come on, smile. If Hitler was alive today and he saw the life that I live, I would have the last laugh, hence the title, The Last Laugh. And I would really recommend this if you haven't seen that documentary. Yeah, that's a great documentary. There's also this book, it's very dense. It's called Humor in the Holocaust, It Kept Us Alive by Chaya Ostauer, is that her name? And um, there's a quote from one of the survivors who said that if it wasn't for humor, we all would have committed suicide. It, it made us feel human. Um, and I think that, you know, my mother would always say, if we weren't laughing, we'd be crying. And you can either look at the macro or look at the micro. And we look at the micro to survive. Because if you looked at the macro, you wouldn't, you'd be in a fetal position, you know, rocking back and forth and crying. But we, we are survivors. And we're going to survive what we're going through right now, too. All right, so we got to the Holocaust pretty quickly. Um, so you know, you you said that one of the the right of the Jewish rite of passage right. is a bar bat mitzvah, b'nai mitzvah, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, this is a situation where you take a kid and you stick them in front of an audience, and they have to give a talk. Right. So so you know, obviously not all Jews are funny. Yet during the 20th century. Uh, majority of comedians were Jewish. Um, so everything you talk to about now, about survival and how we use it as, a, as a, you know, mechanisms for defense and, and, and these kinds of things, have something to do with that. But, but it does, I don't think it answers the question as to why there are so many Jewish comedians. It, you know, is, it, is it like there, are, there were a lot of Jews in the garment industry? Uh, so it was sort of a localized profession that they were involved in. Is it representational? They saw, Jews saw Jews doing it, so they thought, oh, I could do that. You know, for instance, when you got into comedy, how did that happen? Did you, did you see Jews on TV doing this, and did that play a role? Oh, yeah, I watched the um, Ed Sullivan show, and our parents used to take us up to uh, the Catskills on holiday weekends, and I'd sneak into the nightclubs because I was 12, 13 years old, and I'd sit in the back and I'd watch these comedians and um, 
10 years later, after I graduated college, I'd be in those same rooms and I was writing for those same comedians. $7 a joke, by the way, that's what they paid. That was the going rate in 1972. Um, $7 a we joke. We think it's but, nine now, nine times. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it, it, it. Yeah. But, but, but how did that happen? How did you, how did you say, I'm going to write jokes for comedians? It, it, listen, you know, we, we can psychoanalyze the whole thing as a coping mechanism and all these other terms. It's, it's a cultural thing. It's, it's a mindset. I grew up in a house which was not dissimilar from other people's houses, Jewish kids' houses, uh, who are my age. Listen to Alan Sherman records. Um, Vaughn Meader did The First Family. Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner, The 2,000-Year-Old Man. And they were funny. There was a show on that was called That Was the Week That Was, and there was the Tonight Show. And so I just said, gee, I, you know, I watched the Dick Van Dyke show. I was like 12 years old, and here's this good looking guy, Dick Van Dyke. He's got this really pretty wife, Mary Tyler Moore. They got a son, Richie, so he's got a family, a really nice house in New Rochelle, and he spent his days on the, at the office lying on a couch, joking around with Buddy and Sally. So I said to my parents, I want to do that. <laughs> what am I, stupid? That's what I want to do. You know, so I think it has to do with the culture of the household, the culture of the community also. You know what I mean? If you want to get to the root of it, you know, look, old Jew is walking down the street, Nazi Germany, 1941, car pulls up, door opens, out steps Hitler, takes out his gun, points to a pile of dog shit on the sidewalk and said, Jew, get down on your knees, start eating. So the Jew is on his knees, he starts eating the dog shit, he looks up, knocks the gun out of Hitler's hand. Now the Jew has the gun. He says, you, Hitler, get down on your knees, start eating. So Hitler starts eating. Old Jew walks home, says to his wife, you'll never guess who I had lunch with today. <laughs> I hope that answered your question, I really do. It answered a question. <laughs> So, Judy, what about you? How, well, uh, you know, Alan, as you can tell, is way older than me. So I was watching different shows. Um, I remember, um, for me, it, you know, I would watch these variety shows, and I would see um, Phyllis Diller. I would see, I mean, Joan Rivers, to me, uh, Toady Fields, to me, was... I mean, she died when I was 16, but I loved her. I thought, here are these uh, these women who are fearless, um, and especially Joan, fearless. Like every topic, there was nothing that she didn't touch. That even every bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah speech. I want to thank my blah blah blah. They always start with a joke, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I it's. All I know is I feel really shitty now that you were never hugged. It's okay. It's right, okay. Just, go ahead. Go, Plus, go on, also, go on. I I was in high school when SNL started, and that was that was just one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. Yeah. Happened to the world, but to be able it, to yeah. It's hard to believe. I mean, next year will be the 50th year that the show is on, and um. Oh, and, I was in junior high school. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was nine, I was like a prodigy, and um, you know, but a lot of our stuff, but back then we couldn't do a lot of Jewish stuff um, because it was, you know, there was no cable, there was no, certainly no right. streaming, NBC, CBS, uh, ABC, that was television, it was not even Fox, right, so, the, and so we just expanded the boundaries a little by little. There was one writer on the show, uh, Rosie Schuster, you remember her? You remember uh, those of you who are older, which is like a lot of you. The, um, on the Ed Sullivan Show, there was this very unfunny comedy team from Canada, Wayne and Schuster. Yeah. Okay, Schuster was her father, okay? She was Lauren's first wife, but she was a riot, and she pitched a joke once, a sketch. I don't think it even made it to a rehearsal, but the 10 worst Hanukkah gifts ever, okay? And the number one worst Hanukkah gift ever was the Hanukkah that they gave Anne Frank a set of drums, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, That's hilarious. Yeah, I live to be 100, I can't write that joke, you know? <laughs> 
I love that. I, I could see why it didn't make it to air. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, you said you know Saturday Night Live didn't have a lot of Jewish material, um, but a lot of Jews worked there. And you know, when I was a kid, I remember the first Jewish bit was Jewish Jeans, which I think was with Gilda. Yeah. That was a, I, I don't know if it was a, because I didn't write it, um, so I really give a shit, you know. Um, no, I don't know if there was a fight to get it on. I don't know if there was any sort of senses that they had to deal with, because I knew that when I wrote stuff, um, you did whatever you could to be clever about to get something on. Okay, so that I, I don't know. But yeah, Jewish genes, and then Gilda we did a lot of Jewish stuff with, and um, we fought for it, you know, and Lauren's Jewish, so, you know, we got what we uh, wanted. You know, that's not, uh, Lauren's Jewish, but, you know, the, the people that throughout my career have said, you're too Jewish, you know, dye your hair blonde, straighten it, um, don't do so many Jewish, we're all Jews telling me not to be so Jewish. Um, the, right. yeah. That's like, you know, uh, you know, Seinfeld originally was shot down by Jewish executives right. and championed by a Gentile executive. I think that that's a standard thing in the business. Too Jewish isn't, isn't something, isn't a quality that, that people value. Um, that Jewish jeans was like iconic for Jewish girls. I'm telling you, it was, <laughs> it was amazing. So, so, you know, how, do you remember, Judy, do you remember writing your first joke well, I, uh, the first time I did stand-up, it was on a dare, and I was in college, and I did write a joke. Um, I had to do it on my dorm floor in the lounge, and I had to write material about the um, people who lived on the floor. And my first joke was about this, we had an Orthodox Jew, and he, uh, you know, he would leave every Thursday night and come back every Sunday. Um, and he and was this, this is a co-ed. Everyone's just smoking pot and drinking and other things. And uh, I remember writing a joke about um, you know I have to something about I have to get this done quickly because someone's it's not even funny but it was my first laugh. Uh, you know Mitchell Jewy Jew um, has to go home for like for. Um, <laughs> whatever it was, you know. And and I don't remember the exact joke. It was funny at the time, but um and that was my first thing was about this guy who had to this Jew because I felt safe. I felt like I could joke about that. Um but yeah, that's how I th I think like a Jew. I think in Jew. <laughs> and now, wait, what about your first $7 joke? Well, my first seven-dollar joke: a comedian, a Catskill comedian named Morty Gunty. Oh, I remember. Remember that name? Yeah. Um, he called me up. I'm 21. He said, "Can you write me some jokes about sperm banks?" <laughs> I'm 21. Like I gave a fuck about sperm banks. Okay. So I wrote that they have a new thing now called sperm banks, which is just like an ordinary bank, except here, after you make a deposit, you lose interest. <laughs> <laughs> that so, is a uh, great joke. So, so that broke. That made me a professional because I had seven dollars in the in the bank. Um, but the first Jewish joke I ever wrote, which I got eighteen dollars for, I got chai. I got high for this joke, um, was about a, a, a Jewish uh, porno film, which was really unusual, especially the orgy scene because the men were on one side of the room and the women were on the other. <laughs> 18, there was like a feeding frenzy for that one. <laughs> All right, you win the first joke contest. Thank you. Excellent. Um, all right, so w I wanna, w what are some of the cultural characteristics that make Jewish humor distinctive? All right, I, I made a short list of them, and you can, okay. right. you can, comment, you can comment on that. So I started with illness. Illness, dissatisfaction, fear, complaint. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, my parents pretty much um, cornered the market on that. Uh, yeah, I, I think that just like Paul Reiser said there, you know, is uh, anything okay? Yeah, it is a lot of whining. It's a lot of, um, and if you did go up to the Borscht Belt in those days, it was, it was a lot of complaining. And even as it evolved to, let's say, remember Alan King? Like he was yeah, like a I higher love. level. He was the guy. I re, but I remember growing up on Long Island. He sounded like everybody else's father, except he got to go on Ed Sullivan right. and and complain about, you know, airlines and insurance right. companies and mowing the lawn. But and he, you know he was a fat cat with the cigar. But he complained about the same things. And um, when we came along with SNL, um, he was the standard. That was that was the. Um, you know, that was the popular kind of cultural thing. And we came along and we had, um, oh, spray paint on the walls of the what was then called the RCA building. It looked like graffiti that said Saturday Night Live on it. And that was basically our take on doing, it was our turn to do it. But still, at its root, I used to go to Alan King's office all the time. I used to go to the Friars Club, where those old Jewish comics would hang out. And they were a riot. They were really funny. Morty Gunty once took me to the Friars Club, and I used to hang out at the bar and sell jokes. They would meet, okay? And he took me into the big room, the big dining room there. Remember Jean Balos? Yes. Jean Balos was an old, sad sack looking Jewish comedian, big jowls. And um, he took me over to where Jean was with a bunch of people eating. And he said, Jean, I'd like to introduce you to a funny writer. This is Alan. And Jean stood up and he said, you're funny, huh? Yeah, I, I guess so. He said, you know who's also funny? You know, who? He says, my dentist. And he opens his mouth and like 30 chiclets come out like they're his teeth. And to this very day, I don't know if he walked around with 30 chiclets waiting to be introduced to somebody or he saw me coming and he just started putting chiclets in there. That is so funny. How funny is that? But you, you go... The, I loved the, the Friars Club was. Uh, I, re, I would eat lunch there. I'd see Henny Youngman in the corner mm -hmm. by himself every day at the same time. And he would have like, you'd look over and he'd have like a fork coming out of his ear or a <laughs> knife coming out of his nose. And like just sitting there eating, you know, eating as if nothing was going on. It was, it was really, that was such a special place. Henny Youngman, the first week or so, those guys were just wired differently than us, that generation. The first week that I belonged to the Friars Club, um, I was walking down the street. It was on 55th between Madison and Park. And on this particular day, there was nobody on that street. I don't know if it was a Saturday. I don't know why nobody was there. So I make the turn off of Madison to go to the Friars Club onto 55th. About 100 feet in front of me, out of this doorway, steps Henny Youngman. Now, he doesn't see me, so as far as he's concerned, he's alone. That's an important part of this story, okay? He walks across the street, right? As soon as he gets to the curb, where the Friars Club was to step on the curb, a pigeon fluttered down, landed by his feet. He looked at it and said, any mail for me? <laughs> <laughs> he thought he was alone. He was talking to a fucking bird, That's okay? Hilarious. That's hilarious. But those guys did yes, that. Yeah. That's what they did. <laughs> I don't know anybody who talked, who would do that. Do you know anybody sort of our age or younger? I'm serious. Who's got that gene in them to do that? Just yeah. Mm, no. I mean, I would write it down, but I wouldn't say it out loud. Yeah, I'd be right. like, oh, pigeon. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, writing it down is yeah. one thing. Right. Talk to the bird. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say the Bob Mankoff is like that the former cartoon editor yeah. from, the, from the New Yorker. I spent time with him. Oh, I, I don't know him personally. I, I, I spent time with him and joking to him was like a tick. He, he, he couldn't stop, everything, every sentence was a joke. And so there are people like that. Wow. I would find that annoying. Um, <laughs> it, it, was, it was entertaining during the first two hours. Um, then you wanted to kill yourself, right? Well, or him, I wouldn't, or I wouldn't, him yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. So these are, are amazing stories. Um, Wait, can I just add one thing yeah. about the Catskills? So I, when I 
I started doing stand-up in the early 80s, and we, we would do the late show. There was the regular show in the big showroom uh, where it, it was the best of the best. And then the younger comics got to do this midnight show. And this it was, was where? 11 o'clock show, huh? This is where, what, what resort? Uh, Grossinger's, Kutcher's, we, we would, uh, you know, it was a Saturday night, really late it's show. La was it the lounge? That yes, performing? Yeah. that lounge. And so, and the thing is, that they they this these clubs were all inclusive, so they didn't have to pay for the show, so they felt free enough to get up to tell you you know you'd be, you'd do you had to be so good. Here are these tired Jews who just had their midnight snack, and they didn't pay for the show, and it made we became really it was the, it was the hardest show to do of the week, and it really made us strong comedians because I mean yes we love to laugh but you better write a damn good joke um, for the Jews to laugh well remember Freddie Roman oh, of course so what, what I would do is I lived in Long Island with my parents on a Friday I take my mom and dad's car I drive to New City which is where a lot of the comedians lived in uh, Rockland County because it was halfway between Manhattan and the Catskills okay so I'd sit with a guy like Freddie Roman write some jokes have dinner with him and his family, and then go up, watch him do an eight o'clock show, watch him do a 10 o'clock show, and then we'd end up midnight, let's say, at the Raleigh in the lounge. Yeah, the Raleigh, that's right. Okay, yeah. and, and because it was so late, and be, because um, no kids were allowed, they were really disgusting. Yeah. They were really fun and disgusting. I remember Shecky Green <laughs> opened his act. Now, he didn't build to this joke. He opened with a joke about his brother-in-law, who is a proctologist. He said he should have been a gynecologist. Schmuck missed having a good time by this much. And then he got dirty, okay? But that's the way those were. It was, it's like they let loose. Oh, and then yeah. they would introduce these young comics, and you really, it was tough. It was tough, but it was great. Um, so I, I understand also that you initially started out as a comic, or you, you, you tried to. You know, Jesus. Um, <laughs> when I got tired of writing for these Catskill guys, and um, I looked around, and the Catskills, the, the hotels were starting to close. They hung on, even when they were operating in the red, hoping that they would be revived with gambling coming up to the, the region and would resuscitate it like it had done with Atlantic City. Well, that never happened. And so where those guys, where the Red Buttons and the Alan Kings and uh, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, all those guys would use it as a place to showcase and they would get their own TV shows, it wasn't gonna happen by the time I got there. I got there, the guys who were left behind basically so I took all the jokes that they wouldn't buy from me because I figured this is not a career place for me. I learned how to write a joke and I'm very grateful. They were very nice to me, but I took all the jokes they wouldn't buy and I made it into a stand-up act for myself. So there were two clubs in the city at the time, one called The Improvisation and the other one called Catch a Rising Star. And my plan was to go on stage, deliver the jokes with the hopes that a manager or an agent would come in, like the material, and want to represent me to get a job in TV, which is what I wanted to do. The first day, that first week that I'm there, I meet another guy who's just starting out. His name is Billy Crystal, okay? <laughs> he lived about four towns away from us on Long Island. We became fast friends. He would pick me up every night in his little blue Volkswagen. We'd drive into the city, tell our jokes, and on the way back, listen to the tapes and you know, give each other constructive criticism, you know, eight track, you know, those tapes, okay? And I'm about four months into this experiment of mine, and one night, I'm having the hottest time in the world, it's like one in the morning, making these six drunks from Des Moines laugh. And I get off the stage, and I go to the bar, and I'm just hanging my head, waiting for Billy to be done, so I can have a ride home, when this guy comes in, sits next to me and just starts staring at me. And I finally go, what, what are you doing, what do you want? 
He said, you know, you're the worst comedian I, I've ever seen in my life. I said, well, I, thank you. I really, this is going to really help my ego right now. This is, he says, but your material's not bad. Did you write it? And I said, yes. And uh, he said, can I see more? And I didn't even ask who it was. I would have shown it to like a gardener at this point. It ends up, this is Lorne Michaels, okay? And he's going from club to club looking for writers and actors for this new show that would premiere in the fall. So I went back to my parents' house on Long Island and um, I typed up what I thought were 1,100 of my best jokes. And um, I remember I had my meeting with him and I was so nervous. I didn't even know what to wear. I never went to an interview before. I'm going, oh, young, hip producer, young, hip show. Oh, I'll dress young, I'll dress hip. I put on my father's maroon polyester leisure suit, okay? <laughs> I looked like a big blood clot sitting on the Long Island Railroad and I came into the city and um, f for my meeting with Lorna and I went upstairs and um, I, I sat on the bed, he pulled up a chair and I gave him this... You sat on the bed? You know something? Yeah, I sat on the bed. But you know, that changes everything. I gotta revive... You didn't walk in and say, why is there a bed here in his office? No, no, this was the Plaza Hotel. Oh, okay. You said his office. Did I say office? Yeah. Okay, let's take two. Someone I, okay. said no. I Someone got to the said Plaza no. Hotel. I went to his... Huh? Okay, then you don't have to say anything. All right? <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. Okay. You, I went have, to his... you have to be the one. The one. Okay. I went... <laughs> I'm gonna get this out, I swear. Sorry, I'm, I'm gonna... sorry, I'm sorry. I went to his room, okay? Sat on the bed, he pulled up a chair. I gave him this tomb, tomb, tome, <laughs> not a tomb, tome, of 1,100 jokes. He opened it, he read the first joke, and he went, uh-huh. <laughs> then he closed the book, and he gave me a job. <laughs> One joke. That One joke. joke. To show you how long ago this was, from the reference points in the joke, I had written a joke saying that the post office was about to issue a stamp commemorating prostitution in the United States. Ten cent stamp. You want to lick it, it's a quarter, okay? <laughs> that was the joke. Well, what's amazing is I've told that joke. I've told that joke. It's a great joke. Well, you, you now must, you know where it came yeah, from. Yeah, right, it's, yeah. amazing. It's, it's incredible. So, Judy, I... No one cares about me. It's we all about do, we Alan do. growing so up in 1940. After, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. After you wrote your, did your, did your you know, college open mic and you wrote your ha 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 Mitchell joke, um, where does it go after that? What? Well, I, I, I got my first laugh um, and then someone said, it was like 82 maybe, 81. And it was starting the boom, where every place, like Ramada Inn, every place had stand-up. And someone said, I, I, my friend is, runs this restaurant, and, there, and I went into this, it was called the Charter House, it was in New Jersey, and it was a fish place, and they were doing stand-up. And I was like, I, I was so nervous, and I went and I had to write an act that other people, not the people who lived on my floor, and, I'm, oh, I was so physically ill. And I went on stage, and I forgot everything I was going to say. And I remember uh, there was a woman with a huge bouffant, and I started saying, oh, that's my mother over there. She's a member of the B-52. Like, I didn't even know what to say. But I got them. And I, and I had never felt like that. I got my first laugh. I never felt like that about anything, ever. And... Um, and I just started, and then, uh, and then what happened was uh, I was at Rutgers, and uh, they were doing this thing called Campus Comedy, where Bill Sheft, who was the head writer for Letterman, Adrian Tulsh, his, his wife, uh, who ran the open mic night at Catch Rising Star, and Larry Amaros, who is one of the funniest writers, yeah. And it was the three of them, and it was called um, Campus Comedy f Comics from Catch a Rising Star. And I got to do, I won something where I got to do five minutes with them. And I went on stage and the, the three of them said, you're really funny. Which, you know, I mean, they were professionals. And 
and uh, I was 19, and Adrian said, come to Catch Rising Star on Monday nights, and I'll put you on. And I, every Monday, went to Catch Rising Star and waited to go on. I never got on. But, um, <laughs> but I kept, I would go anywhere to do, it. it, it was, this, I just was chasing that, that feeling, and I still get that feel, like to this day, when I, you know, get on the subway to go down to the comedy cellar to try out a new bit, it is just as exciting as it was the first time I, I got on stage. I, I love, I love the whole process. When you became a comedian professionally, what did your parents say? Fantastic. Um, no, they hated it. They wanted me to be a music teacher. Get your teaching degree. Get your teaching degree. Um, but I always worked t to make enough money that I didn't have to ask them for money. And I was a typesetter during the day. And then I would go out and do sets. And then I started going on the road. And I would make like $600 or $500. Uh, I'd have to go away for a week. But I, you know, I just wanted to be a great comic. And you know, if you'd stop asking them for money, uh, you know, they really have no say in anything. And then uh, my father died when I was uh, before. He never got to see me on TV. But um, I, I, th we found this like um, folder, and he had all every little, you know, article that had my name in it, and so I, you know, they were very, they were very supportive. And then my mother literally wrote my act for um, 30 years. I mean, <laughs> I would call her. She, I, I'm like, oh, I got to write new material. I'm, yeah. And we would just have these. Com I mean, I would literally say verbatim what she said to me on the phone. <laughs> and for example. Um, Okay, yes, there's, there was this one, I don't know if you remember, well, I'm sure a lot of you do. Um, in, a, in 1990, maybe, uh, uh, a, there was this guy uh, called the Dart Man, and he was throwing darts at women's asses. Do you remember this? Yes, he was in the subway, and he was throwing darts at women's asses. And everyone was worried because it was during the AIDS crisis, so they thought, oh, you know. But anyway, and then the New York Post was like, beware of the dart man. And I got home, and there was a message on my answering machine. Judith, wear thick clothes. And it was like that pretty much every day. It was... I used to play an answering machine message that she left me because um, we were on the telephone and I was at my agent's office and we got disconnected pre-cell phones and I didn't call her back and she thought I was dead in my apartment. I used to play this message. She's like screaming, I'm going to call the neighbor. I have to call the police. So long. And, um, and it was just constant. You know, then she got to the nursing home and it was, Judith, I have nothing. So please, when you come, bring a hunk of cheese. <laughs> and really, I love that one. Um, but it was, you know, she was very, and so, the, and this daughter, mother-daughter relationship, it transcended Judaism because everyone has a mother figure. Um, and it was universal. It became universal. People loved it. Uh, uh, answering machines became a, a big thing. Right. Because I remember when Robin and I first got married, I had an outgoing message that I said, Alan and Robin are in home right now, which I'm very happy about because I just broke in and I'm stealing all their jewelry, okay? <laughs> Okay, so Robin and I come home this one <laughs> afternoon, play back the messages, right? And I hear Robin's mother's voice going, oh my God. Like the, as if the guy who broke in answered the phone and he announced what he was doing. <laughs> Next message was, see what I mean, Sam? As if the guy answered a second time, said it verbatim the same way, okay? Then you hear Robin's father saying, I'll handle this. <laughs> And we sit down, we're watching TV, 20 minutes later, the cops indeed no did show, I swear to God, I had a show on my driver's license that I lived there. Oh yeah. So Jews with answer machines yeah. were a thing. Um, <laughs> that is so funny. So you know, none of that answered the uh, question as to how- Oh what, my God. Oh shit, you and your questions. What's it now? <laughs> All right, um, how's comedy writing changed? And especially in the, in, 
concerning Jews or Jewish topics, let's say? Perhaps it hasn't. I don't think that it has. I think that, Judy, you might, you might disagree with me, but I think that we are more accepting of it. Um, I, and I think more people know what the culture is so they they understand it. Um, and I don't think that, uh, I don't think that we have to censor ourselves the way we once had to. And I think it's more important now, as you said earlier, given what's going on in the world, and you know, go to campuses and what's well, the Gaza and all that stuff. I think it's more important than ever to keep on churning it out the way that we are. So uh, no, um, I, I have to. You disagree? Yeah, because you know, I, you know, I still go out and do sets, and I have to say that since October seventh, in my forty-two years of performing, I have never. I you do a benign Jewish joke. It's never, they get quiet. Um, their reaction, it, I've never experienced anything like this okay, before. Well, my... And comics are now saying, I'm not gonna do my Jewish material, it's not worth it. Okay, who's the objection coming from? Uh, Jewish people or people think that Jewish people would object to that? Um, well, I've gotten free Palestine screamed at me. Um, uh, from a specific I... joke? Get, just or if just, I do just a Jew, it's you, you know, you're, I'm a Jew. Um, you know, it's so hard to, na this is one of those things that's so hard to navigate. It's interesting that there are, there are a portion of those who are like, oh, I'm not allowed to laugh at that. There's, there, and, and while the Jews are hysterically laughing, you know. Um, Have you seen Spam a lot again? I didn't time? see it the second time. Okay. You will go back to it, all right? It was really funny the first time, and now it's 19 years later, and there's a lot of Jewish stuff in there, and there's an interesting thing that takes place is there's a millisecond as if the audience is processing, right. am I allowed to laugh at that? Right. And they do. But that's been happening for I, I a understand while. that, yeah. but you had asked about writing, and I don't think that when it comes to writing, when we're alone, yeah, there, there is the kind of thing I know that sometimes the instinct always was to be the first draft you write, whatever is funny, then you get to modify it and you'll get notes and all of that. There is a little bit where you're going, oh Jesus, they're not gonna like this. Well, that, that's but what's you still yeah. do it though. I still do it. Right, though. but it's now, people. some people think it's a good thing. Like, oh, oh, they're gonna take it. The, like the, the comic, there's no comedy without intent. What is the comic trying to say? There's nuance, there's context, but it, it's these people you hear one word and don't listen to the full thought. Um, they, you know, I'm a Jew, like I'll get on stage now, not, you know, not a great time right now for us. Um, and you see who it's, it's some of it is hate. And I, it, you know, I got, I get off stage, I do. Uh, I'm still very outwardly and proudly Jewish on stage. I don't shy away from it. I talk about Israel. I talk about everything. And I will have, uh, I will see people go like this, and then I will have people as I walk off stage say thank you or write to me and say I've been so depressed to hear someone talking about their Jewishness on stage. It was it was so healing for me. Thank you for wearing this. You know, it comes. It's both sides. And then there are the politically correct people who are like, I'm going to be offended at everything. I yeah. People, I mean, you know, um, I was at an elevator once with Mel Brooks. Okay, here okay. we go. It, okay, I got to break this up a little bit. Right. Okay? Yeah. And we're going down. And we're talking. Elevator stops. Doors open, and a Far Eastern woman with a sari, and she had a red dot yeah. in the middle of her head, and Mel looked at her and went, your coffee's ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I hear laughter, and I heard a couple of people groan. <laughs> that woman laughed, okay? I don't know what to tell you. But that's what Gilbert used to say. I interviewed him for my book, and he said, I, he said the thing I don't understand is their, your initial, your involuntary action is to laugh, and now audiences are going, ha, ah, oh right, not supposed to do that. And that's, that it to me, you're not being a horrible person. It's a natural, it's a natural response. 
And you're, you know, I'm sorry, but yeah, we, we need laughter in this world. And, no. you know. Stop taking ourselves so seriously. Absolutely. It's, it's, yeah, you're right. We can't take ourselves so seriously. And if we're laughing and we're talking about it, and I know that this is easier said than done. I understand it. Because I, when I go out and I do my own speaking engagements, I, I can tell the difference. But it's also a big release. Also, people come oh, up yeah. to me afterwards, thanks for making me laugh. Right. You know, I think we just have to do what we do. And you're right about intent. That's really important over right. here. What are we intending to do? Right. You know, a Jew bought a house right next door to Rockefeller. And he bought the same car as Rockefeller. And he mowed his lawn the same way as Rockefeller. And he put the same retaining wall in front as Rockefeller had. And Rockefeller came over and he said, uh, you think you're as good as I am, don't you? He says, no, I think I'm better. He goes, why? He says, well, first of all, I don't live next door to a fucking Jew. <laughs> now, <laughs> what can we learn from that joke, yeah. okay? <laughs> So we learned that Have we answered any of his questions. No, 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 no. You, 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 you haven't. So we learned that self-deprecation plays a significant role in Jewish right, humor. Right, we do it before they get to it. They, you're, they're not going to yeah. humiliate us. Right. We're going to. We, we're, we've got it done. We, we know. You know, and and that's the way we do it. Uh, and you know, it's interesting. All right, now I'm going to really get into Holocaust. Ready? And, you know, in 1934, shut up, but in 1934, and this is why dictators hate, this is why, you know, Trump left the White House correspondent, he couldn't deal with that, you know, it, in 1934, Hitler passed the uh, Treachery Act, and it was comedians who were, you know, like cabaret, who were in the clubs in Germany, who were speaking the truth on stage, and um, Hitler passed this law saying that uh, listening to or telling an anti-Nazi joke was punishable uh, by uh, imprisonment or death because humil there's nothing more powerful than humiliating someone. And that, and he passed that in 1934 and the year before that he started banning books. So I feel like we are in this really precarious situation right now. And I do agree with you that, yeah, people are being more careful, but people are also shut, closing their minds. You know, there's a part of it that's like, you're opening your mind like, oh, that might be, you know, like they're offended by proxy. You know, no, um, it, it's, I feel like we're having less discourse uh, and we're going backwards, kind of. I think it was more Jewish before. I think people are shying away from the Jewishness now. Well, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. At the same time, I think it's more. Imp it's most important that we continue to do what we've been doing. Right. Okay. I think we turn into the skid here, and we just keep going because, because, um, like you're saying, if you're talking about. Hitler in 34, and what happened the year before, and all of that, and you got a guy who may be president right. again, who's saying the things that he's saying about retaliating, and he said, if you're Democrats who are Jews, you know. Well, he, he, wanted, he wanted SNL investigated. Um, you know, he has, no, yeah, and he's now talking about Jews and trying to split us up. Um, it, it's terrible. I mean, I have a joke. I do. I talk about Israel on stage, and like you just say the word Israel, and half the people hate you, right? And I, I've been to Israel. Um, I have a joke about how you know it's a democracy. It's a very young country. Some of the people in the government are assholes. Oh my God, what country does that remind me of? Okay, and then I say, but you better laugh at this joke because he's been telling all these jokes, and they've been getting like applause breaks, and I really want to kill myself, but. <laughs> I tell this joke about how I went to Israel, uh, and and uh, recently, I went last year for the third time, and I I realized that in Israel there are things. It is a democracy. There are things you can do there that you can no longer do in the United States. So when I arrived, I said to my my girlfriend Elisa, I said, "Oh, we're here. I think I'll get an abortion." <laughs> It was a food baby, but um, 
But even that, like, I, you know, it's a subversive thing, but it's true, it's a democracy. Um, but even that, you know, it's, it's, it would get a huger laugh. It would get a huge laugh on October 6th. And now it's like, no, I can't even talk about that. You can't even say that word. And that's where we're headed. Right, well, I think, you know, from your last book, you know, there's an indication that comedians have been censored, you know, forever. Right. And it's, it's you know, it's a constant problem that... Because that we're truth tellers. Yeah, right. Um, now, would either of you be willing to entertain questions from the audience? Well, it depends well, on who asks them. Yeah. Ask them. Can we do that? Is that a sure. thing that we Absolutely. could do? Absolutely. You could just ask Alan to tell more jokes, and that'll be it. I they may have no, they they may have nothing to ask. Let's let's find out. Does anyone have a question? Anyone? Can we talk about the cheese? No. <laughs> do you ever worry that you're running and not funny? Well, I think that. I realized that this evening. <laughs> I always get, I always, I'm like, oh my God, I because I get really bored with my material and I want, and I'm always reading and trying to, you know, educate myself about things so I can write more material. And I mean, there are some times where you're just like just sitting there and you, nothing to say. Sometimes the muse is just, yeah. They take off, they go somewhere else, and um, I've always, I feel this a lot that I've written my last joke, I've written my last book. Um, Isn't that sad when the, you think that? It's the, I'll, list, I'll look at old stuff that I've written, yeah. and I'll go, I don't know if I could write that today. Right. And so it's scary. It, it, it is scary. And it, it's an occupational hazard, and it's not specific to us. Um, I remember if Neil Simon, in his, um, the preface to one of his uh, anthologies, he said his dream in life is to have his first draft be the one that's produced. And the name of the book is Rewrites, okay? And it's, it's really hard, and especially when we're doing this alone. You know, you know, if you work on a TV show, it's very communal. You're at a table, there's a writer's room, there's a synergy there of all these funny people being together. But when you're doing yes. this by yourself, so, yeah. it's an unnatural act. You know? I love it. I love being in a writer's room. Oh, the writer's room is it's the best. It's the best. Because even if you're not in the mood, someone will say something, like, oh, yeah, and you can, yeah. Yeah. This is the Jewish Power Network. What's your thoughts about the current SNL? Oh, the current SNL. Can you hear in the back? No. The, the, the question was, what, what are your thoughts of the current SNL? What are the SNL? thoughts about the current SNL? Oh, sorry, I'm not moderating. Okay. <laughs> current SNL. Well, I, I'm, I watch it usually on Tuesdays because I'm an old Jew now and I DVR it, okay? I can't watch it live. You know something, um, it's hit or miss. Um, I, I watch it because it's my alma mater. I root for it the way I do my old high school football team. I can't play for them anymore, but I want them to win. I think that every time you think that, okay, they've, they've run it, out and all that, Kate McKinnon comes along, and um, you, you get, you know, Cecily Strong, you get all these funny people, they're out there, and I, I think that they may even have a harder job than we did, because when we did, like I said, there were only three networks, now there's a thousand different outlets, okay, and you're not going to dazzle anybody, you're not going to out, you're not going to, um, you're not going to even turn ahead if you say something which is off color. I think the job that they have to do is be wittier, okay, because you have Fallon on earlier in the week and you've got Colbert and you got all that. So I think, um, yeah, it's hit or miss, but also, uh, I root look, for them. Look at who, they're gonna always be compared to previous casts. Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm not gonna say anything negative about it because I know what the process is and the fact is they reconstitute themselves every few years on live television and they find a new equilibrium. So I'm rooting for them. I, I, I agree, I'm 100%. There are times where, you know, you know that a news story is gonna happen, it happens on Tuesday and you're like, oh, I can't wait to watch, to see what they do with that. And sometimes I'm like, oh, they just missed it. But it's part of the, you know, comedy is the only art form where the audience 
is the major part of the creative process. Because like you could think something's funny, and then you like you bring it in front of an audience, and you get the response I got this evening. So, um, <laughs> but it's true. No painter, you know, stops mid painting and says, uh, you know, brings some friends over and is like, what do you think of the tree? Should I move the tree over here? Should I put a bird? And, but we don't know. Like we don't know where the line is until we've crossed it. We really need you, and then you turn on us. So that's the, yeah. No, I mean, and a singer is only always going to get an applause at the end. Right. Okay, we we know if if a joke doesn't work, you're not laughing. We know immediately. Oh, I'm not and it's personal. It's really personal, you know. So it's it's a different art form, and I do think it's an art form. S speaking Dana? of crossing. Oh. Um, Oops. So I, that's you know, we, we just want to repeat the question so everyone hears. Okay, go. Um, she asked if, uh, if people who uh, turn on you for the Jewish material root for you for the gay material or some other material. I have had the entire, m much of the entire gay community turn on me for the Jew, you know, for being pro-Israel um, or being a Zionist or thinking Israel has a right to exist. It's, you know, and I mean, I just got, I just got a, a DM. I loved you as a child. I watched your special over a hundred times. You meant so much to me and now look at you, you know, and it's, it's constant. Um, and it's funny because, you know, I'm, I was one of the first mainstream comics to come out, um, if not the first, who was, I mean, there were, oh, thank you. But there were other comics who were working in gay clubs and they were out, but I, I was working in straight clubs and I had a child and I started talking about my family and, um, and, and I fought for the rights of the, of, you know, the LGBT, I can't go on, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, and, and I represented and, uh, you know, and now it's so disheartening. Um, this whole victim and these are the victims and these are the perpetrators, and all Jews think alike. It's, it's you know, it it's unbelievable. It's really unbelievable to me. Um, so it's yeah, Dana. It's been really, it's been really hard um, having this whole community you know turn on you as if you're, you know. Oh, sorry, uh, hi, sorry Steve, to hear that. Years ago, you could have movies like Kentucky Fried Movie or Airplane. Um, you can't make those movies anymore. The, the, the censorship and the sensitivity and, and, the, and the danger of transgressing over here. Um, how does that, how does that like, curtail the comedic process these days? Where's that voice coming I from? <laughs> oh, my oh, oh, God. There. I kept looking over here. I know, I'm like there, like, and bunch no of one's moving their lips. Over here. Yeah. Oh, it's over there, okay. <laughs> yeah. It was such a mellifluous voice. Yeah. I know. Thank no, you. No, 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 dulcet tones, yes. <laughs> so did you hear the question? Yeah. <laughs> I think you well, were, we well, already answered. What was the question? About, you, 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 you know, you, these, pl these movies and, you know, like Airplane and all that. You can't do those anymore. But, you know, you have to realize that as words have different meanings, things have happened in the world that change things. Some things aren't funny anymore. The world's gotten smaller. I, you know, I still think it's funny, uh, but my kids don't. They're like, oh, I don't know. you know, it's, it's generational. Don't you think? Oh, God, yeah. I remember trying to show my kids when they were real young uh, Marx Brothers movies. Yeah. And first of all, it was like black and white. Right. Like, hey, with this, <laughs> you know, it looked like lepers, you know. And, um, and as they got older, okay, they started to appreciate it. But th that's, there's a sophistication that you acquire right. where you appreciate something given the context and the time that it was produced. And if you look at it like that, if you, if you look at um, uh, AMC, what they have is a lot of, um, no, TMC, right? At night, they show those old movies. And uh, with uh, Mankiewicz, is that his name, Ben? Yeah, yeah. I really like him because what, but what he was forced to do, and he preserved a lot of movies because of this, guess who's coming to dinner? Now, if you remember that movie, what, what kind of an outrage it was, it was a real breakthrough that Sidney Poitier was coming over with the right. daughter of Spencer Tracy and, um, and Catherine Hepburn, right? But he explained before they showed it, they didn't want to show it. 
he said, let me set it up. And he said, this was 1967 and this and that. And he put it in a context and you appreciated it for it. Right. So I think that there's a certain amount of lack of education versus education when it comes to appreciating. I was having lunch with some of our mutual friends today and I was saying like, you know, cancel culture is, is such horse shit. It, it should be, you know, in the sense that if you have a body of work Look at when it was produced right. and written. Don't play with its integrity with what is now a set right, of right. rules, okay? PC and stuff. And um, I just think that that's wrong. It's true. Uh, there are jokes that I did 25 years ago, 30 years, that I would never do today because the world is a different place. Uh, and if we erase all those movies, we're erasing history, and and that's why all of this banning is disgusting. It is disgusting. It, we're gonna just repeat the same mistakes. Can't say this word, you can't tell that story, I'm triggered, too bad. Guess what? There, every safe space has a door to the real world, okay? <laughs> Life is not easy. Oh, okay. Uh, Does someone have a mic? Okay. Uh, as a Jewish atheist, I wanted to ask professionals like yourself, is it okay to make jokes about Jewish religion and its practitioners? Is religion off limits like Holocaust or is it not? Okay, you need to be on a cartoon or something. <laughs> Doesn't he? <laughs> I love the way you speak. Um, okay. <laughs> Can you make jokes about the the? I, I do um, when I'm in front of Jewish audiences uh, that'll understand those jokes. I think um, we're at as a comic. We're at the point. You know, I have a line for myself, and the line is, if the audience is laughing for the wrong reason then I will not, and I know, you know, every comic knows when they're up there if the audience is laughing for the right reason. So if I'm telling a Jewish joke and I think they're laughing at it for the wrong reason, that's my line to call them out and, and not do that material. But you gotta really know your audience. Um, and there's jokes I do in front of Jews that I could never, non-Jews wouldn't even understand. This just reminds me, the other day I was listening to Gilbert Gottfried's al album, Dirty Jokes, and on this album, uh, he does a version of The Aristocrats, which is a famous joke, you could look it up. Um, and it was a film. And it was a film as well, and Judy was in it. Um, My mother was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> And during Gilbert's telling of the aristocrats, while all kinds, uh, where he's describing all kinds of monstrous sex acts, he integrates the text of Chad God Ya. <laughs> and it's a, tr it's a real moment of brilliance of integrating some Jewish religious text with, with the aristocrats. And I, I don't know if anybody but Gilbert could do that, but it's really, it, I recommend it if you can, if you want to look it up. Gilbert was a genius. I mean, genius. I was on this stage with him a number, you said it was seven years ago, and Gilbert, you know, there was such a, a mind at work there. He was really smart, but I, I didn't know him that we weren't friends. I was living in California when he, I knew who he was. So at his funeral, I was asked to eulogize him, but Susie Essman uh -huh. was telling personal Gilbert stories right. and about how cheap Gilbert yes, was. Yes, yes. Supposedly, they were all in a car, a bunch of comics, and they drove down to Philly or something like that, and they all appeared someplace. And now on the way back, right, uh, Gilbert, they realized, was the only one who didn't pay for gas or a thing. And they said, Gilbert, this is George Washington Bridge. This is the last shot you have to be like a person. And so he took out of his pocket these crumbled bills and he went, so long, fellas. And he gave it to the toll taker. I mean, but he was just this really sweet, funny oh, guy. He was the greatest. Can, can I um, 
as for, I mean, first of all, I just want to say this has been fantastic. Um, I'm having that thing again where I can't see who's talking. Yeah. Okay. Over here. Oh, there. Um, okay. So one uh, very well-known Jewish comedian, Woody Allen, has not yet been mentioned on this stage. And speaking of cancel culture, I'm just wondering whether he has been canceled. Uh, I, you know something? Uh, I'm going to take the plunge here, okay? You look at that body of work that this man did, over 50 films, comedy albums, his books, right? And um, I was not in that attic. I don't know what happened, but I don't want, it would be a shame for our culture that if you took whatever you believe happened and you just canceled that body of work because we're gonna be the losers that way, okay? It's great, I grew up idolizing him, all right? I just did. We have a I, can't, I can't watch Bill Cosby anymore. Uh, Cosby, I can't watch either. No, I can't. Um, well, Wagner didn't get canceled. Wagner did not get canceled. Canceled. Uh, Chanel, Coco Chanel was a Nazi. Oh, oh you, you watch go it to on synagogue, TV, yeah. and everyone's in a Chanel suit. We have a couple. We have a couple questions curve, from curve the Zoom. Enthusiasm. We have a couple questions from the Zoom audience, if that's all right. Oh, um, okay. How would panelists advise breaking into the comedy scene as a young Jew today? How what? I don't even know where that voice came from. Uh, it's at, I'm it's over here. It's Ben. It's over there. Ben. Okay. How, how would a young Jew go about breaking into the comedy scene today? Uh, there, uh, get go to an open mic. I, I, you gotta do what you know. You gotta talk about what you know. You have to. Uh, you can't shy away from things. Um, you have to speak the truth. You have to get in front of all different kinds of audiences. You have to fail. It's just do it. It, it shouldn't matter that you're a Jew. Yeah, I don't think there are separate rules for that. You just go and do what people do, right? I, I don't think it's gotten to the point where, okay, Jews, you go that way, you know? <laughs> Curb well, your no, we have, I've, ha I've been having protests at some of my shows. You showed me that. Yeah. When I do speaking engagements, I know that that stamp joke, if you want to lick it, it's a quarter, is going to really work. But it's a really interesting thing with that because I speak at colleges also. So I get 17 and 18 year old kids, when I get up to that joke in my presentation, they'll come up to me afterwards and go, why would you lick a stamp? You just peel it and put it on the thing. <laughs> so the shelf life is really sort of. Curb. Curb your enthusiasm. Uh, curb your enthusiasm. First of all, I want to thank you for Curb Your Enthusiasm. Okay? You played an integral role and uh, That's Larry, uh, David's Larry David's show. And I was watching the episode where Larry uh, uh, was eating in a Palestinian restaurant and uh, uh, he wanted uh, uh, Fudruck or whatever his name is to go in. Um, what's his name? Fudrucka? Funkhauser, right. And uh, Larry David got involved with the Palestinian woman and they had a sex scene. Uh, that culture is not canceled. I mean, it's on TV, it's there for everyone to see. And uh, I don't know if culture is canceled as much as people think culture is. Well, I, I, you have a point there. You're absolutely right, because once again, it's other people saying that these other people are gonna be offended by it. Larry's a very unique case, though. I mean, Larry, you know, he, he, he had this, I was working on the show the first few years of the show, and I remember him saying something about he put it into the outline, because it's not scripted, it's just outlined, and then they have these wonderful improv uh, players just um, improving about uh, a relative of his who, um, uh, in New York City, who um, died, you know, during 9-11. Not, not the towers, he was uptown, he got hit by a bus, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I don't know how many people could do, Larry can get away with a lot of stuff, you know? We have one more question from Zoom. 
As Mel Brooks represents the last of that generation of Jewish comics, are we worried about losing that style of humor? Oh, that's an excellent question because there was a rhythm there and there was roots there. A um, good friend of mine just passed away a few months ago, uh, Norman Lear. He, he was part of that. It was Carl Reiner, Norman Lear, Mel. Okay, the only one of those 90-year-old uh, guys, Dick Van Dyke, who's not Jewish, is still alive, okay? But they, um, I, I worry about that because while there are Jewish comedians who are younger, all right, and they're carrying on a tradition, if you're talking about intonation, inflection, uh, I don't know who carries that standard after they go. I just don't, do you? I, I totally agree. I see the young, younger comics don't have that yeah. Yiddish kite um, that, I mean, I definitely have it, um, but I do, it's, it's changing, it's, yeah, people are, are being, and they're more careful, too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, this is not gets, funny. This gets back to what I opened with, yes. that if you scratch the surface of American comedy, you'll find Yiddish. Right. And as you say, that's with, as far as we get. I mean, think of y Yiddish as, a, it's a hilarious, every, it's so colorful. You know, there's so many words that are, you just say the word, you you know, like ungapachka. I mean, there's just so many great Yiddish words. Um, Shugan, I mean, the people, you know. I had written Yiddish. a show for Billy Crystal with him called 700 Sundays, and it was very much about his family who I never met, okay? I didn't, I, I met his mom, but his dad died when he was 15, and you know, his, um, his you know, uncles and aunts, I, I didn't meet them, but then again, you're talking about a common denominator, I put words in their mouths, because I just pretended I was writing from my family, right. okay? So there was a commonality, so you talk about Yiddish, so I g gave him the joke, you know, they spoke mostly Yiddish, which was a combination of German and phlegm, okay? So, <laughs> that worked, okay? But, but those jokes are gonna go away. Right. That, that's not actually true, incidentally. Can I, can I just say one? Uh, you can, sure. Add me at Bush, Bill. Yeah. This, this, I think, will be the last question, sorry. Okay. Now we have a lot of pressure on you. You do. So, my best friend, and you go to his house, and in the bathroom above the toilet, on the wall behind the toilet, is the, um, the analysis of the pilot for Seinfeld, okay? Mm -hmm. And it said, unlikable characters, <laughs> no storyline, okay? It gave it a, either a D plus or a C minus, all right? And you, what you have is the initial knee-jerk reaction to anything that's new. Go, you attack it because you haven't seen it before and it doesn't follow form. And then somebody like Brandon Tartikoff, who was the program, if you remember him, at NBC, he said, I like this show. He did the same thing with Cheers, okay? I don't care that it's limping along the bottom of the ratings. I like it. Let's do everything we can to get it out there because it's quality. I don't know if the corporate structure of things now allows for a visionary like that to do something and to, to defy everything else. And everything's owned by corporations yeah, that's now. That's right. So. Okay, so it used to be more mom and pop-ish, you know. So your Seinfeld thing is very, very well taken, you know. Right, so on that cheery note, uh, I'd like to thank Judy Gold and Alan Zweibel. And thank you for coming. Uh, we have blintzes and borscht outside for you. I'm not making that up. And please register for the course, uh, evo.org slash comedy. Thank you all so much.